So let me introduce our, our two distinguished uh, speakers and discussants. I am really, really pleased that we have Todd Stern with us. Todd Stern is a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, concentrating on climate change. He's working now on writing about climate change negotiations during his time, a special envoy, as well as writing, speaking, advising on ongoing efforts with climate change, both internationally and domestically. He has an incredible background. He served from January 2009 to April 2016 as the Special Envoy for Climate Change at the Department of State. He was President Obama's chief climate negotiator, leading the U.S. effort in negotiating the Paris, the very seminal Paris Agreement, in all bilateral and multilateral climate negotiations in the seven years leading up to Paris. He also participated in the development of the U.S. domestic climate and clean energy policy. Before that, Todd served under President Clinton in the White House from 93 to 1999, mostly as an assistant to the president and staff secretary. From 97 to 99, he coordinated the administration's initiative on global climate change, acting as the senior White House negotiator at the Kyoto and Buenos Aires negotiations. From 91 to 99 to 2001, he also served as counselor to the Secretary of the Treasury, Lawrence Summers, advising the Secretary on the policy and politics of a broad range of economic and financial issues. So Todd has been in the climate change game for a very long time and has seen all of its ebbs and flows. Dean Steinberg is the 10th Dean of Johns Hopkins, uh, SAIS. Prior to becoming the Dean, he served as a university professor of social science, international affairs, and law at Syracuse University. And he served as the dean at the Maxwell School from 2011 to 2016. He previously served as deputy secretary of state from 2009 to 2011, serving as a principal deputy to Secretary Clinton. From 2005 to 2008, he was Dean of the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs, University of Texas, maybe three times the charm, Jim. <laughs> From 2001 to 2005, Dean Steinberg was Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution. He served as Deputy National Security Advisor to President Clinton from 1996 to 2000. During that period, he served as the President's personal representative to the 1998 and 99 G8 summits. Prior to, to becoming the Deputy National Security Advisor, Dean Steinberg served as the Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff and as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Analysis in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research. It, I'm a little bit flabbergasted that he's our Dean, to be quite honest, with this incredible resume. Anyway, Todd, Jim, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you both so much for taking the time to do this. And we're really looking forward to the conversation. Excellent. <laughs> anyway, I hope you heard what I said. I just wanted to thank you all for, for all that you've done. And uh, especially for those of you who are finishing your time here at SICE, uh, looking forward to sharing the, the celebrations with you in the next couple of weeks and, and the great events leading up to uh, commencement in a few weeks. So it's it's a great privilege for me to be here with Todd. Um, as you heard, I mean, I, it's always embarrassing to hear these uh, accounts of one's career. It just sounds like people who can't hold jobs, Todd. But, um, <laughs> but you, you've you seen that uh, Todd and I have had parallel careers, uh, which means we've had the privilege of working together for a long time. And if Jess had gone back earlier in our histories, it goes back considerably further than that. So uh, for, uh, through uh, both not just administrations which successfully achieved the presidency, but several which didn't. Uh, exactly. So um, so it's, you know, this is really interesting for me because I, I had a chance uh, to be involved to some degree, but mostly as somebody who was backstopping Ambassador Stern through, the, through all these negotiations. And what you heard from the bio is if you think about the trajectory of the, the discussion, the international discussion about climate change and the need for international action. You can date it from different places. You can date it back to the Earth days in the 1970s. But realistically, if you sort of think about when this really became a part of the, the mainstream international debate, it really began in the early 90s uh, around the time of Rio and really didn't take off until the mid late 90s. And so in many ways, um, Todd Stern has been there at the creation, has been there as part of every major 
climate negotiation for the last 20 plus years. And so has a unique insight, not only to contemporary events and what's going on right now, but to sort of understand the evolution of how both the United States and the world have sought to both define the nature of the problem and to think about the kinds of solutions that could be brought to bear. So I, I, I warned Todd, I wanted to ask him to sort of think before we get into some of the specifics and particularly Paris, which was so important, um, to sort of just reflect broadly on what it looked like when you first took up this portfolio um, 30 years ago and, um, and how both, how we think about climate and the nature of the challenge and the nature of the re responsibility to deal with has changed and evolved uh, over that period of time. Is this working? Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much uh, to Johns Hopkins for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me. This is the first live audience I've been in front of for a long time, so that's uh, really nice. And you should all feel incredibly grateful um, for having uh, Dean Steinberg as your dean, because I, I won't belabor it, but I would say that Jim is the best thinker on foreign affairs that I've ever met. So he's he's a, he's a, a wonderful guy to be here. Um, so, uh, you know, I got I got really into climate change in uh, in um, uh, the around June, July of 1997, when I was minding my own business doing a different job in the Clinton uh, White House. And the chief of staff came down and asked me if I could jump in and help the preparation for what was a big uh, climate um, conference coming at the end of the year. There is just to for you to keep track of, 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 of the lingo, there is a big conference, they're always known as COP, so COP1, COP2, COP, et cetera. Uh, and so Kyoto was, uh, was a big conference um, coming up and there was a lot of preparation that had to be done. Uh, you know, in, in terms of the sort of broader picture of, uh, of where climate change was at uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a policy issue and as a problem back then, it was something that had been taken note of. Uh, I mean, if you could go all the way back into the 60s, if you're looking just for scientists, but it was but it was bubbling up as a bigger issue, sort of starting in the late 1980s. And in 1988, the UN formed uh, something called the IPCC, Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, which is a science body, it's still super important and, and much bigger than it used to be. But they formed that in 88, which is a sign of, uh, of, of growing concern, and, and then uh, established a, essentially a committee uh, to, in, in, uh, in December, I think, of, uh, of 90 to begin to negotiate a framework convention of some sort on climate change. And that, and that turned into the 1992 uh, framework convention on, that's actually the name, framework convention on climate change, which laid out broad principles, um, laid out an objective, uh, which is just a very broad objective to prevent dangerous human caused uh, climate change. Uh, and very importantly, divided the world into two categories, essentially developed and developing countries, uh, and uh, established a principle of differentiation between the two, which is a complicated phrase, became the most quoted phrase, I'm sure, in climate, in, in, the, in the annals of climate change. Uh, ever and still, which is uh, common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, otherwise known uh, as CBDR. Uh, people generally drop off the RC sometimes for a particular reason. But anyway, um, so that was and that that was that was the start back in uh, back in ninety two. But what 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 the ninety two agreement was not was an operational agreement that that was going to uh, to lead to real action. So that would come a little bit later. But in terms of where the public was at, I think the public was at a, a place where this was not this was not a big deal. This was not something that people were thinking about very much. Um, it seemed like something distant. It was very different from now where you have these kind of gargantuan uh, extreme weather events huge forest fires uh, and, and droughts and floods and superstorms and temperatures going over 120 and, and, and all the rest all over the world. I mean, we, you, know, you tend to hear it uh, in the US because that's where, where, where the news reported, but it's happening everywhere. Uh, and, and it's happening more in, in a more and more extreme way. And one of the things that's interesting is, you go back to that IPCC that I was telling you about, the IPCC started to do 
uh, assessments uh, every uh, X number of years. This year, they've been releasing assessment number six. So they go all the way back to 88. This is the sixth, sixth assessment. And the thing that's interesting is every time the scientists come out with, with dire and urgent warnings, it turns out that what happens is worse than that what they predicted. It, it, it's happening faster than what was predicted. And so eventually people started to catch up to that. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't right away. I think if you, if you go back to the Clinton White House um, that we were in, you know, there was a, there was a, a provision in, the original, in that original 1992 treaty which called for developed, each developed country to, uh, not in a mandatory way, but to pursue the aim of holding their emissions to 1990 levels by 2000. And I, the, the job that I, the main job that I had in the White House staff secretary is, is, is a job that where, you, where you're sort of an inch deep and a mile wide. You, like everything comes through you that's, that, that's going on its way to the president. So you know a little bit about everything, but, uh, but I have, so I, I, I only say that by, by way of saying that, that, that there was not an intense effort being made in the White House to achieve that uh, non-binding goal. Um, that was that was written into the 92 agreement. There were meetings. Uh, I think the people in the environmental shop were certainly focused on it. I think probably people in, in Vice President Gore's shop were more focused on it, but it was not a big deal. Uh, and, and that was kind of where things were at for most people. I should say that there were some prescient scientists who were all, all over this and very worried. Uh, and, um, but it, it hadn't penetrated that much. And I would say in terms of, of, of where the public started to engage, it just, you know, it, it, it wasn't in one fell swoop. It was year to year and and, and few years at a, at a time that the, the impacts seemed, uh, just started to become greater and greater. There was action uh, ultimately on, uh, well, I think the action, the first significant action was back in around 2005 on Capitol Hill where Senator McCain, back when Republicans and Democrats could could even think of doing anything together, and a Republican could think of doing anything uh, progressive. Uh, McCain and uh, Lieberman uh, put forward a bill, which um, uh, which is essentially a cap and trade bill. I, can, I won't go into the details unless anybody wants me to. But um, it got 43 votes back then. That wasn't so terrible. Um, but you know, you had that. You had when uh, when um, Obama got elected then in 2009, you had a very intensive uh, effort then to do a, a, another try at a cap and trade, a cap and trade legislation um, that was advanced by uh, Congressman uh, Waxman and Markey, got through the House, not the Senate. Uh, but, and, and, and at that time also, there was, there was significant business support. I mean, when we were, when we were in the White House, um, again, back with Clinton, I used to joke that I was the only, the only person in, in the building who could, who could bring business and labor together because they both hated what I was doing, right? So, so that was changing. And, and then uh, again, the change in public opinion and public attitudes has just kind of gone up like that. So um, you, you were there for Kyoto. Um, the administration put a lot of effort and priority into that negotiation. It was a difficult one and, and uh, didn't look like it would succeed, and then you and Vice President Gore pulled it out at the last minute. So you want to tell us a little bit about what it took to make that happen, and then, of course, that's the good news, and then it tells a little bit about the story about what happened after it was uh, adopted and what happened back here. Yeah, so I, I, will, um, I will take no um, credit or responsibility for, <laughs> for the shape of the Kyoto uh, Agreement, which was, uh, which was negotiated over a period of about two years. Um, and, uh, so the person who really gets the most credit for getting, uh, Kyoto done actually agreed to in, in, uh, in Japan, uh, was Stu Eisenstadt, who was actually thrown into, he, Stu was an undersecretary of state, uh, at the state department, but not on this portfolio. He was on a different portfolio, but for a set of reasons, not worth going into, he got tossed into it. Uh, I came along uh, as the senior person in the White House who was kind of uh, on top of this, having spent sort of all my time for the previous three months working on it. Um, 
And that was a negotiation where Kyoto was essentially the, the place that, that, that took that common but differentiated responsibilities language and firmed it up into what came to be called actually by sort of both sides, if you will, in, in climate uh, talks uh, over the years as a firewall between developed and developing countries. So Kyoto uh, established a, a very rigorous um, legally binding regime for developed countries. The targets were actually negotiated. You didn't just show up and say, this is what I'm gonna do. You showed up and said, this is what I'm gonna do. And then you, and then th this was actually the biggest activity that, that Stu Eisenstadt and I were part of uh, in, in uh, Kyoto was negotiating in a, it, along a very long <laughs> rectangular table, essentially a three-way negotiation between us, the Japanese and the European Union. And the other hundred and you know, whatever, 60 countries were not really relevant because most of them were, um, were developing countries and they didn't have any obligations coming out of, uh, of Kyoto. And not only no obligations then, but also nothing built into the agreement as it certainly could have been, as, as you will find in other international uh, arrangements, that there would be a point at which countries would graduate up from the, uh, from the, the, the status where they don't have to do anything to the status where they do. And again, there are international agreements sort of like Kyoto where that doesn't happen and other ones where it, where it does. And, and nor was it a case where uh, at a certain point, there would be just be a phase out of, of, of an arrangement that had been made. The Montreal Protocol was uh, was um, negotiated a little bit before uh, before the Framework Convention, but back in the early '90s or late '80s. Uh, that was that was that that's the regime that uh, protects the ozone layer, which was very threatened at a certain point, and. Um, and they set up. They also recognized two different categories of of countries, and and uh, provided that everybody had to do the same thing, but with developing countries getting a 10 year uh, grace period where they didn't have to do anything. So there's all sorts of different ways to do this, but none of those were part of Kyoto. So, uh, um, so that I mean, the negotiation was essentially a, a long and, and difficult negotiation where, you know, the, the arguments were about, I'm gonna reduce by 5%, by 6%, by 7%, by four, by eight. You know, it, it, was, it was around in, 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 in numbers like that. Um, and the deal got done um, and uh, that, was, that was the objective. Um, but the, the, uh, that firewall divide was, it just made it, not just very difficult, it made it impossible to get uh, approved by the, by the, by the Senate. Uh, and there are different kinds of international agreements, and, but international agreements that are uh, treaties, as the word is used in the Constitution, require uh, approval by two thirds of the Senate. Really, really hard. Uh, at this point, it's hard for anything. I mean, if you, if you look at uh, really incredibly unobjectionable agreements, they often get like scotched now because of, uh, so in any event, it, it couldn't get right. done. So, but this was another one of the achievements which maybe you do or don't get credit for. Not only did you bring labor and business together on opposing what you did, but you brought the entire Senate against. This was voted 97 to nothing to reject uh, the Kyoto Treaty. Before yes, a, a little bit, a, li a little bit earlier in the in the year, but yes, that that's uh, that's quite right. Yeah. So and the other reason I mention this is because so Kyoto is is signed by the United States. It's it's basically then on arrival in the Senate, and as some of you will know, um, uh, shortly thereafter, when President Bush is elected, the Bush administration withdrew from the Kyoto Treaty. So we now have a treaty which is nominally accepted by large parts of the international community, but, but and, and nominally still signed by the United States, but essentially dead in the US. So there's this period of eight years, and then you come back and it's, and President Obama is elected. How did you start to think about what had been learned from that? And how did that help you develop a new approach to dealing with the problem of climate? 
Well, that, that that's exactly the right question. So, um, so the uh, as Jim said, the the Bush administration uh, pulled out and basically just went dark on on climate change, uh, even at the domestic level, and in, in, in for all practical purposes. So, you had eight eight lean years of the Bush administration when it came to uh, climate change. Um, so. Obama gets elected. Hillary Clinton's going to be the Secretary of State, um, and she asked me to be her uh, uh, the, the special envoy. And uh, and I start talking even in the transition. I start talking to people who um, uh, are at state who I knew back from my previous time there. And the if if one thing more than anything else uh, kind of conditioned my approach when. I arrived in this job. It was that we are not going to agree to another uh, to another agreement that we cannot join. That that that's not good for anybody. It's not good for the rest of the world. It's sure as hell not good for the United States. And so uh, so I was bound and determined to not make that mistake. And it's also the case that the prevailing paradigm of the negotiation was uh, such that if we had followed that paradigm, we would have been exactly in the same place. Uh, so, and, the, and, and when I say the paradigm, I'm basically talking about a legally binding agreement, which will only be binding on developed countries. The, the mandate for this negotiation that, um, so there's a mandate for, the, for the, a, a new negotiation in 2007, because at this point, the, the world clearly understands that it's, that it's no good to have an agreement without the United States. And, and since developing countries are also not really covered, Kyoto at its, at its height never covered more than about 25% of global emissions. So you couldn't, you couldn't live off of that and people understood that. So, so new mandate, but the new mandate still kind of protects these same kind of uh, distinctions, um, and and uh, and the again the paradigm is the the, it, the the new mandate looked to developing countries to do some, some somewhat more than they did in Kyoto, but still in a very loose way, nothing legally binding. Uh, you're invited if you want to, if it if it if it suits you, if if it works for your internal uh, circumstances, you could do something voluntary. Uh, and by the way, if you do, with all sorts of um, of uh, of assistance from developed countries, etc. So it was a very, in, in that sense, it was a very unbalanced uh, mandate, and 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 as I say, a, pre a prevailing paradigm which just didn't work. And I, I would say that the Europeans, for example, did not like this. I mean, they didn't like the fact that that there was that 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 the same kind of uh, division uh, was was meant to be built into the agreement, but their tendency was to say, "Well, we'll go first. It'll be okay, and after a few years, they'll be inspired by us and they'll join." And I, you know, I was already hard bitten enough um, that I looked at that and I thought, you've got to be kidding, right? I mean, that's just like you're naive. That's not happening. So we knew we knew what I just said that we couldn't have that kind of paradigm. And uh, and there was a question kind of early on, the first few months as we were kind of developing our you're both at that point talking to all sorts of uh, of diplomats from other countries to get to, you know, to start just to start the conversation, but you're also working on what your specific strategy is. And there was, and we had developed two options in uh, in my office. And one was to kind of go go faster in the, this is the wrong paradigm, we can't do this. And the other was to be not too out front uh, in that. And there was, a, there was a meeting, I don't know if you remember this one, Jim. <laughs> um, there was a meeting, uh, Principals meetings in administration means usually the secretary or deputy secretary of, of cabinet agencies, and I, they weren't all there. But there was it was a pretty big meeting, and um, and the advice that I got uh, at that meeting was take the go slower approach. Now, don't go and get and and get you know mud on you right away. You've got tremendous amount of of uh, of idealism and hope and 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 joy that the US is back and that the US is not only back but back with such a charismatic 
fascinating figure as Barack Obama. So don't, you know, don't sort of uh, rain on the parade right away and, and kind of work it through a little more slowly, which was actually super good advice. So the, the process goes forward. Um, and after a very long and arduous and often colorful period of time, we get a new agreement. Uh, it's, it, it is the new paradigm, right, which includes everybody. Um, it's an agreement which is not a top-down approach. Each country can decide for itself what uh, its obligations are with some mechanisms to try to encourage them to do more. But it does follow this new model that you, uh, that you proposed. But it's Groundhog Day again. So the, the Groundhog Day again, which is the U.S. signs it. And, uh, and we get a new president who then suspends the U.S. Uh, involvement. Um, and, and then after four years, uh, a new president comes back, another Democratic president, who once again wants to join. I guess the question then becomes, the world has seen this before. It's out of Kyoto. It's easy to Paris. How much credibility do we have now, both from the fact that we sign and then we don't ratify, we sign and we withdraw, we sign, but then Congress doesn't ever enact the provisions that would make us to actually implement the commitments. Does the world take us seriously? Should they take us seriously? Does it make a difference that you know we go into these negotiations implicitly making commitments and then not necessarily seeing them realized? Yes. So that's the that is uh, that's the right question. Also, um, so just just to um, to clarify one thing, which is it, it's Groundhog Day in a way. It's not exactly Groundhog Day because we elaborately, carefully negotiated the Paris Agreement in such a way that it would be one of those types of international agreements. They're actually the majority of international agreements are like this, but one of those kinds of international agreements that did not require Senate approval. So that that mission from the start we actually um, we actually uh, um, completed and uh, and countries you know already by that by the time we were we were going through these negotiations from 2009 to 2015 countries understood that that they understood that there were constraints on the United States. They'd actually seen the United States walk away from an agreement. They knew that we weren't bluffing when we said. If we do it this way or that way, we're not going to be able to join. And so, um, so all of that was quite helpful, and we were able to start in the agreement. Uh, but again, we started. We were we were in the agreement officially for about 15 minutes before Trump got elected. It was literally like the the election was either the day before or the day after the 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 actual uh, taking effect, formal legal taking effect of the agreement. So then. Um, so that was, of course, was quite bad, and uh, people were quite chagrined about that. Interestingly, the uh, career office at the State Department that does these issues was kind of allowed by, you know, certain people in the White House to continue to go to the negotiation sessions. And at this point, the negotiation of the agreement had been done, remember, in 2015. But when you do an agreement like this, Okay, I should stop talking. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, so uh, there, there are in, in, in any event um, uh, follow-on negotiations for guidelines and whatnot, and, and so there, there was actually constructive engagement by um, by the State Department, even while Trump was president. But okay, then then Trump is is out, and Biden comes in, and he comes in, you know, with with all the guns blazing on climate change, a great team, um, serious, uh, he, he announces a new target for the United States for the period up to 2030, which importantly was aligned to what, what scientists have come to see as the, the, the goal that we should be going for, which is to, the temperature goal, to hold temperature increase to 1.5. Paris had said well below two best efforts to 1.5. So Paris was in that general ballpark. But the scientists, as I said, every time they look again, it gets worse. So they they pushed to 1.5. And the US target was in that, in that range. And it wasn't just a target, but it was a target backed by all sorts of tough, good new legislation, which mostly now has not been enacted. And so that's so we I think are in a really difficult place internationally if 
I mean, there is still a chance that a decent chunk, I think it's a diminishing chance with every passing day, but it's not dead yet. There's still a chance that, that a significant chunk of the climate legislation will get done. Um, one big piece is definitely not getting done because Manchin wouldn't let it happen. But, um, but it, it, so it makes the, it'll make a world of difference if we, can, uh, if we can get that legislation done, both in terms of our capacity to actually uh, meet the target that we took on and from the point of view of our international partners looking and saying, okay, uh, they at least got this done. But I, but I would say, Jim, that, that even, if, let's suppose we do get that. There, the, the international community has been burned now. They were burned from their perspective back in uh, back at Kyoto and they're burned again by Trump. And they are completely scared of what happens, whether it's Trump or some other Republican, whether it's 2024 or 2028, that like you can't count on the United States the same way anymore. So it's, it's, it's very tough, but it's sort of, I think if you're an international player, you can't live with the United States and you can't live without them, right? So they want us to be doing all of these things. And when the US is in the game, the capacity for, for there to be leadership that a large number of players follow is just much greater than when they're not. So I'm going to turn the questions to the audience in just a second. I'm going to do one more uh, of my own, which is the, so you mentioned in the earlier part, you know, how the world had changed a lot, greater uh, energy and urgency around this, and much more tangible sense of the impact of climate change. One of the other big things that's changed over the 30 years since uh, Rio uh, is China, right? Um, at the time of uh, common and differentiated uh, obligations. China was a very small part of the global emissions. And today it is by far and away the largest emitter. You spend a great deal of time uh, in a variety of capacities working and talking to the Chinese about that. How serious do you think the Chinese are about this? And what will it take for China now as by far the largest emitter to do what's necessary to make it worthwhile for everybody else to take on the hard decisions that they need to take on to get to that 1.5 degrees. Well, I think, look, I, I think there are uh, lots of, uh, of people and, and including um, government people in China who do take it very seriously. I think at the highest level, they take it sort of semi-seriously. Um, the, uh, the big focus on the COP that just happened in Glasgow was on countries, uh, coming forward with uh, uh, increased, uh, tougher, stronger um, targets in order to be as close as we can get to keeping the 1.5 degree hope alive, right? So, and if you look around the world, there were a, a bunch of important moves that were made, the US, the EU, the UK, uh, Japan, Canada, Korea, um, South Africa, not too bad. So, uh, and that obviously doesn't touch 195 countries, but, but it, it gets to a lot of emissions. The big player who didn't do that was China. And China now is, has 27% of global emissions. It's independently bigger than all the developed countries in the world put together, um, uh, more than twice the size of the US. So uh, they have a, actually a quite impressive long range goal that Xi Jinping announced, uh, I think two, um, two falls ago. Um, which is to get to uh, essentially net zero emissions before 2060. The scientists are urging 2050, but that's pretty darn good uh, for China. But, but, it, but the scientists are also telling us that, that we have to have a big, big move between now and 2030, or you're never gonna get those longer term uh, uh, targets realized. So, and China is, uh, has not wanted to move. now. I think there's there's also an important feature here. Um, it, it doesn't change everything, but it but it matters, which is the nature of the U.S. So do I have two minutes to do the nature of the U.S. Uh, U.S. China relationship? So when when I came in, um, I, I first met with my Chinese counterpart, who ultimately became a great friend, Xie Jianhua, who is back doing the same thing now. Um, uh, in March of 2009, and at that very first meeting, I said to him, you know, you and I ought to try to make climate change a positive pillar 
in the relationship between our two countries rather than just another source of aggravation. Because almost everything that you think of between the two countries tends to be a source of aggravation, even back then, although not nearly as bad as now. And he sort of thought that sounded interesting. And we, you know, 2009 was still a pretty difficult year between the US and China, but the, the, the personal relationship between the two of us was excellent, sort of from the beginning. But China, it, it was very difficult in the pretty seminal um, conference in Copenhagen. But they also came out of that conference feeling, I think, I mean, I don't know this for a fact, but it was definitely my instinct always that they felt that they, that it had not gone well for them, that they had gotten not just on the wrong side of players like us and other developed countries, but on the very wrong side of, of the poor and vulnerable countries in the world, which they don't like to do. And so I think from then on, there was, uh, we, you know, we, rest, we were wrestling on issues all the way to 48 hours before the Paris Agreement ended. But over time, and certainly after the really tremendously important events of 2014, where the US and China did a 10 month secret negotiation, um, which resulted in the two countries and that to the two presidents doing uh, a joint announcement in Beijing, each one announcing what their targets were going to be and embracing a document which had a lot of good, good things in it about how the two were going to work together to get this done. And um, so you got to a point where we would we would go tooth and nail, hammer and tong, whatever, uh, in these in these negotiations, but understanding that we were going to arrive at a place that we would both live with, right? And that was really incredibly important. I don't think anything was more single. No, no single event was more important to getting Paris done than the than when Obama and Xi Jinping walked down the aisle together in, in Beijing and, and made that announcement. And then, uh, as I say, you know, I, I mean, I just met constantly with 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 Shia, and and we became very good friends, and you know, took each other to our hometowns, and came over to my house for dinner, and and uh, and all of that kind of mattered, and and, and was helpful, uh, and so you you, I think she is still a very good guy. I'm sure he has a very good relationship with John Kerry, but the overall relationship between the two countries is so if not toxic, it's very difficult now. It's, uh, and the, you know, there's good things and bad things. You, you know, you have competition, but you also have things you can work on. And through it all, you have the strategic and economic dialogue at the very highest level of, of the governments uh, once a year, every year. And you have all sorts of other touches by senior people um, during the year, as opposed to not much. Uh, not much that's not negative now. So I, I just think this is a very difficult setting to negotiate, you know, to make good progress. Thanks, Todd. Um, so time for you all. Um, if you could just raise your hands and we've got microphones coming around. Who's got the and mic? Let's also just give a Todd and Jim a, a round. Microphones. Um, so please just raise your hand and we'll bring the microphones to you. And we'll also try to capture a couple of call of the questions online. So Danielle, you can come on up here. She had her hand up first, right in the front row. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I have like my main question is I just got out of my politics of protest class and we were talking about this. But I was wondering in, in your personal experience in these negotiations how much of a difference have the climate protests made? I know like in, with COPs, there's always like a big mobilization in front of it. But in practice, what role does that play, if any, in uh, shaping the discussions that you have? Is it effective? Is there ways where it could be more effective in pressuring policymakers? And I was wondering very briefly as well, because you mentioned the BU's approach of let's just go first. And then th this is like a separate aside, I guess, that you mentioned how the EU usually has this approach of let's just go first and then we'll inspire them um, and how that is a bit naive. But I'm just wondering in practice, isn't that kind of what happened, especially in the past few years where they, with the Green Deal, with the carbon border adjustment mechanism, with all, all of these very ambitious policies, they've kind of been spearheading it and the rest of the world does sort of seem to be following now. But I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Thank you. 
I guess we're, um, Jess has persuaded me we should take a couple of questions, okay. those, and, and so we can try <laughs> to group them. So let's let's take a couple more, and then um, so let's do three questions at a time, and then. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Todd. And actually, uh, I'm working for Mr. Xi Jinping in China, and I heard like a lot of story from him about your relationship, like your friendship and your like cooperation uh, since uh, Copenhagen. So I learned that like in Copenhagen, like US and China had a lot of conflicts and that conference, conference didn't end well. And then like six years later, we saw like uh, the US and China like join hands to like like to, to make a lot of diff uh, efforts that leads to the Paris Agreement. So I'm curious, like what will be the key, like, um, like reason, like what uh, contribute to that kind of transformation? Yeah. Great. Maybe the one question in the back, the gentleman with the blue vest. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm Irvak Patel, a doctoral candidate, but I also am here just for the semester. I work at the Green Climate Fund. And there was a hundred billion dollar promise um, that was agreed to as a part of Paris. Um, I can't remember now if the actual wording was in the Paris Agreement, but nevertheless, the intention was always there. And I'm curious if you could highlight perhaps um, why that promise hasn't really been fulfilled. Um, the Obama administration wrote two checks of 500 million, which is far short of the hundred billion mobilization. Um, so if you could just elaborate a bit on your thoughts as to why the funding has been so um, limited from the developed side. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for all those uh, those questions. First, let me um, address the question of, uh, of protests and, and uh, action. Uh, I actually think it's really important um, that uh, I think that, I mean, if I back up for one moment, this is, this is what I'm gonna say now, is, is what the, the protests are just a piece of what I'm gonna say now, but I think that if you, if you think about what is necessary to get national governments, including our national government, uh, to move uh, and to, um, uh, to, to go as far in the right direction as possible, it's, it, it has to do a lot with, uh, with this, their sense of whether it, it matters to people who are going to vote for them or it doesn't. Uh, now, the, the world has gotten more complicated since uh, you have the, the sort of Trump effect of, uh, of two parties being so radically different now. But I still think if, if you look even at polling among uh, young Republicans, it's much more positive on climate change than than, than older people, but but I think that that the demonstration of uh, of uh, the the change in attitude um, of the of the public of of civil society of business um, in a way that radiates into the government is a really important thing. So, I mean, I I, I go back to uh, I forget exactly which year if it was two thousand fourteen or fifteen, but there was a march during the UN General Assembly week in New York um, that had about, I think, 400,000 or something like that people in the streets of New York. That kind of thing is really important. So I, I mean, yeah, obviously it doesn't work alone, but, uh, but I, I mean, if, if you look at what needs to be done on climate change, I, I, I sort of do this little mantra often. Um, we, uh, we have a lot of the technology we need and we have the innovative capacity to, uh, to develop what we don't. We know perfectly well what kind of policy incentives and, and disincentives to use. We can afford it because it's, be, it's gonna be more expensive to not do this before you even count on climate damage. It's just straight out gonna be more expensive to not do this, uh, to not, and the, the, this being the transformation of the economy away from fossil fuels. Um, but the thing we don't have is political will, and uh, and that and that again taps back down into um, into what's expressed on the street. So I think that that's important. Um, on the question of uh, of uh, look of the, of the EU, uh, the EE, it's great to show leadership in, in, in what you're doing uh, domestically, and and uh, and. Um, I, I'm all for that, and the and the United States is, uh, you know, if if we could get things through Congress, we'd be trying to do the same thing. Um, that's different from saying uh, that that here in an international agreement where it's really pivotal pivotal that we get uh, all players acting, 
and big players, I mean, developing countries at this point are 60 plus percent of emissions. Um, so the notion that we'll take the lead and someday you'll follow us, it just doesn't cut it. I mean, it just doesn't work. And, and that language, the, the, the developed countries taking the lead language goes back to 1992. Right. I mean, these categories go back to 1992. They were categories that were essentially set up on the basis of material well-being of the countries, but they're just they're just set in stone, right? So that's what makes no sense. Not that there, there should be differentiation. We're all for differentiation. Just got to be the right kind. Um, what is? Oh, uh, the, the, the China question. So, are you asking? Um, the, what was the key to getting on a better foot then, or what's the key now? Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, so the relate again, the relation, sort of the underpinning, the relationship was um, was developing in a quite good way uh, in two thousand nine. The Chinese came in, I think, with some some some. Uh, kind of bright red lines in their minds. Uh, and certain of those couldn't really work. And, uh, and they, they took the pos uh, positions which, as I said, alienated their poor developing country friends, not just the likes of the United States. So I think that they just, I mean, we, we never talked to them about that. I think they just, they, they I think, took stock and decided that that, that wasn't the way they were going to want to approach things. So. And I think they didn't want to, they obviously didn't want to get uh, on the wrong side of their fellow developing countries. And they also, I think they didn't think by the time we were done in Copenhagen, that it was all that good to get into a alligator wrestling match with the United States. It, it just, it didn't go well. Um, I mean, that, that I, we don't have time for it, but that was a quite extraordinary uh, cop in which, you know, Barack Obama barged into a, into a room at the, the, toward the very end with the leaders of China, Japan, uh, China, uh, India, uh, South Africa, and Brazil to get, you know, to get the final two points, you know, done. So, um, so I think it was just, I, I think there was a will on the part of, uh, of, of the Chinese to find a way to work together without giving up things that were maximally important for them. I had that, I'm not just me, but you know, the, our, our side certainly had that feeling as well. We, I mean, and, and we differed with what, you know, what we need and what they needed, but over time, we just kept working at it, I think. And, uh, and and it had it had the what we were doing had buy-in at the very highest levels in in the U.S. and I think that was also important. On the very first trip that Hillary Clinton took as Secretary of State uh, in February of 2009, it was to Asia, which was already a signal. There was a sort of you know we usually the, usually go to Europe first, but now we're going to go to Asia because Asia is a rising uh, of rising importance. And um, and it, it was a trip to uh, Korea. Japan, Korea, China, and uh, and uh, Indonesia, and um, you know she her her in her mantra she listed three things that were her top priorities. One of which was climate change, and she brought me with her. And in the way these like diplomatic things happen, which is where you sit kind of matters. Can people say, oh, you're sitting right next to the secretary? Or, you're 11 seats down. She put me right up there next to her. So all of that sent a message to, to, to everybody she was meeting with, but on climate change, most importantly, China, that this was a big issue, like right from the start, the first month of the administration. So I think all of that was important. Um, 100 billion. Uh, so the 100 billion was first pledged in, uh, in Copenhagen. That was, that was part of the deal that got Copenhagen done. Uh, it was not a binding thing back then, but... Um, and you know, the I I've lost track of exactly where I, I think that it that the developed countries have gotten to around ninety or the high eighties. They haven't quite gotten, and I and and the understanding in Glasgow was that by the COP in twenty twenty three they clear the bar of the hundred billion. The truth is, and it goes way beyond the time we have here, the, the, the finance, the financial assistance issue is completely fraught 
It's mostly not being approached in the right way. The 100 billion, we have to do that because we said we were going to do it. But in fact, there's got to be probably 10 times that much going to developing countries, but not through the device of, of developed countries saying, here's the money. It, it's got to be done in a way that, that uh, intersects with the private sector and a whole lot of other things. But, but it's also incredibly important. And it is the thing which is more poisoning the well in terms of relations right now between developed and developing countries than anything else. And it's going to make the upcoming cop in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt, hard. Mm. Yes, yeah, should, should we do another round? How about a couple of questions online? Are there any online? No. No? Okay. So a few more in the room. We've got 1977. She's raising her hand. It's probably not the year you were born. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Todd. Uh, so my question is that uh, do you think the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict will affect the process to stop climate change? Because some experts think that uh, the conflict will force the Western countries to collaborate uh, to develop uh, renewable energy faster. So to what extent do you think that this conflict will accelerate the uh, energy transformation? Other questions? Yep, right here. And then we got one over on this side. Hi. Um, so when considering um, how to mitigate climate change, one metric that I look at a lot is the per capita emissions, and particularly given as the U.S.'s uh, per capita CO2 emissions are still much higher than many developed and developing countries alike around the world. I was wondering if there's ever been some talk in the um, on the U.S. side to um, look at this metric and work towards ways to um, bring this down specifically. Thank you. Okay, right, right there next, yep. Yeah. And then we'll take the last one in the front, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you guys so much. Um, I would like to ask about the US's role in supporting India in um, its uh, energy security, energy development goals, and also um, climate change. I mean, as as he just mentioned, India is still a very low per capita emitter, but um, developing really, really rapidly. Thank you. And one more right up here in the front. Gentleman with the bow tie. That's how I'm often known. Uh, hi, I'm Connor O'Brien. Uh, kind of bouncing off your question as well, um, what, if any, um, reductions in standard of living do you think the American people are willing to make uh, in addressing climate change? Um, and how does that affect um, how we are able to achieve deals uh, on the global stage in addressing climate change? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great question. <laughs> take, it, take a drink of water on that one. <laughs> so all, you know, everybody's asking really good questions. Um, so let me start with Ukraine. Um, so first of all, well, first, first of all, it's a tragedy that this is happening, and it, it's uh, it, it's it's quite horrendous uh, to have to see. Um, but uh, with regard to the impact, I I, I think it's I, I think there's a short term and there's a long term, and there's a there's a risk that the short term can get addressed with long term solutions, which would not be good. Uh, and there are. I mean, I think if we sat and really tried to to uh, to uh, dissect this, there probably be a lot lot more uh, potential impacts than than what I'm focusing on. But what I'll focus on is is uh, are the impacts with respect to fossil fuels. And and the uh, interestingly, not so surprisingly, I think I, I think many in the fossil fuel industry, when this started, when the war started to happen. Uh, and when prices started to go way up on uh, on oil and natural gas and so forth, uh, there was some sense of, hey, we're back. We're not going to get we're not going to get knocked out by these renewable uh, energy by renewable energy. Um, you need fossil fuel more than ever. See what's happening in Ukraine. You, you need us. Um, I think what what is I think that's wrong. Um, but I think what is right is that there is uh, that there are uh, needs for oil, even more natural gas in Europe um, beyond what uh, what 
their supply uh, will be if they really start to reduce significantly what they've been getting from Russia. Um, from a slight, so so there are. I think that there are short-term concerns, uh, certainly about rising prices, about tightening supply. I mean, the U.S. opened the strategic oil reserve to a level that they've never done before to put more um, more oil barrels out on the on, out on the market, so you would not have prices go up even higher. Um, but the the best analysts that I've read on this and it and it strikes me as uh as uh as on target is that uh looked at in the slightly longer perspective this should accelerate the transformation away from fossil fuels uh because for for two reasons one is just price because you've got all of this volatility which is always out there i mean so we'll god willing we'll get past this war before too long but something else is going to happen at some point, and so you've got you you've got uh, volatility. If you think about renewable energies, make it simple: solar and wind. Almost all of the money that gets invested goes into get goes into building the facilities in the first place. You got to build your solar panels. You got to build your windmills, uh, and then it's free, right? It's the sun. It's the wind. You don't you don't you're not paying somebody in 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 the Middle East or in Russia or anywhere else for the supplies. So that's appealing and also the um the prices of renewable energy have been quite spectacularly falling over the last 10 12 years so that there it's actually cheaper now to use to, to use solar or wind than, than it is to use coal so the fact that they're that they're cheap the fact that you can get them without without facing price volatility on the one hand or without facing somebody who's going to weaponize their resources uh, on the other hand, so, right? So, so I think that that in the longer in the longer the, the thing you need to avoid is to say we have a short term problem with natural gas. So let's build fifty year installations uh, to to take care of the short term problem. That's not a good idea. Um, okay, that's just one question. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Per capita emissions, yeah. Per capita emissions is a is uh, is an important metric. Um, it's uh, the way that the U.S. becomes better is just for the U.S. to uh, reduce its emissions more and more and more. And uh, and if we if let, let's just say we were to meet the target that we have out in in 2030. Our, I don't know what our per capita is now. It's a lot less than it was even when I started at state, and it will keep being less and less. Uh, so there, there's not a way, I think, in a way that you can get agreement among parties to say, let's just do the whole thing by per capita emissions. But but those like India who uh, and others and many others who have very low, that's you know that's part of what they they always talk about. That it's quite fair to talk about it. Um, the U.S. and India. Uh, so India is a. You asked that question, right? Um, India is a fascinating player in this world. Um, they, when I first came into the job, I sort of thought India would be the most challenging country for us to to uh, to deal with because they're very, very. I, I perceive them to be very, very dug into the uh, to the traditional developing developing developed country you know total split that uh that um i think you can go all the way back to indira gandhi in the early 1970s uh who said uh the economy before environment or something i'm sure i'm butchering it but it's basically it, it, it's that so you, you've had a you, you've had a historically uh a, a an inclination to say we shouldn't have to do anything at the same time, in that year, in 2009, going into the middle of 2010, middle maybe even the middle of 2011, you had one of the most important ministers in the whole world, uh, in India, in terms of uh, of making possible what happened. His name is Jay, Jay Ram Ramesh. Uh, after a couple of years, he switched to a you know was switched to another ministry. I don't don't think it was because of his his very advanced. Thinking on climate or not, but he 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 both was able to work closely with China and and Brazil and uh, 
and South Africa in a grouping that came to be called the basic countries. Uh, and he was able to nudge them forward in ways that were, that were quite constructive. So, uh, and I, I, I participate in a, in a twice a year US India, what's called a track two dialogue where you have people not in the government anymore, but who've been, you know, in quite senior positions. And, um, it's, it's super interesting, tons of really, um, of really gifted people there. And I think that Modi in many respects is inclined to do the right thing. They're also really, really tied in with coal. And, uh, the most important thing is to help them, uh, get past that. There's a lot of work being done by various different players, both in government and outside of government. I'm in a, I'm a, on the board of a terrific NGO, which is called um, the Rocky Mountain Institute. They do a lot of work on the mobility side of, uh, of, um, of life in India. So uh, helping to get all those two and three wheelers that you see flooding the streets when you're in an Indian city running on electricity. So uh, I think India is, is going to be a, you know, a, a quite constructive player, but, you know, they've got very, very significant challenges. Uh, one more question. Um, oh, how much are Americans willing to reduce their standard of, of living? Uh, how about zero? Right? I mean, I don't, I don't, but I'll tell you something else. Uh, it, it, it's, look, changing lifestyle is something that would be extremely useful in lots of ways. But it's, it's, not like if you're in the government and you're thinking about what policies to put in place that that can have an impact and can be publicly supported you don't really want to say look all you have to do is reduce your standard of living because then however much you might want that to happen you're going to lose people you know the other side of the coin though is you're you you can change from driving a, a an internal combustion engine car to driving an electric car to getting your you can't quite choose to get your power green right now. Sometimes you can, but the more that kind of thing happens, the more you will have the kind of change you want. You know, you you have uh, in some places. I mean, it, it would be great if 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 U.S. cities looked like Copenhagen from the point of view of the zillions of bicycles on the streets every day going to work. Um, but uh, you know, and some of that is probably going to come too. But it but in terms of saying, look this is what you have to do. You've got to like change your standard of living is not even the right way to get to lower per capita emissions. So thanks, Todd. Um, and before we wrap up and give a truly effusive thanks to Todd, I, I just want to comment a little bit on a common thread about, especially these last questions. And I, you will learn as you sit and hear me sit in these things that I'm always looking for teaching moments. Uh, when we do this and this and, and one of the teaching moments here is, is why we make you take economics classes. So I mean, we go, you raise the question about per capita emissions, right? And and so the at, at the deep, deep of this debate about climate, there's sort of two fundamental problems, which is one is equity and the other is efficiency, right? Which is we, we have an, an equity set of imperatives so that this is done justly and that people who are poor or who are less have less benefited from the carbon economy ought not to pay the price for the, what we've done before. But you also have efficiency. And the problem that we face right now is that the developed countries, as Todd said, have actually reduced their emissions considerably. And it's very, each next, each marginal unit, as you will have learned in your economics classes, of, of reduction is quite expensive, as opposed to in the developing countries where there's a lot of low hanging fruit and the marginal cost of reducing it is much less. And so the, the challenge here is to marry the two objectives, the, the equity justice side with the efficiency side. And we haven't had a chance to talk about it here, but so many of the, the solutions that make sense to this is to devise policies that can achieve both. And so Todd talked a little bit about cap and trade before, we didn't get into the details, and I think he was right not to, to do that. But part of the motivation for some of these market-based mechanisms is because it's a way of doing both, which is to get the most efficient reductions, but to make sure that it isn't the poor who have to pay for it. And so as we think about strategies here, and I think it's been one of the challenges, is how to make people understand that one of the ways to, to not put this as an eat your spinach 
is if we can devise mechanisms that that reduce at we can decide how much we have to reduce the key is one how do you what's the cheapest way to get to where you want to get to and then make sure that the burden of that is fairly distributed and that's really the deep policy challenge that's always divided climate we as policymakers have some very good ideas about how to do that the question is how do we then make these acceptable both domestically and then within the international community. You want to comment on that before we sign off? Yeah, just, just one really quick thing, which is I, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Jim brought it up. That the is, issues of equity and justice are just resonating now more than ever before and resonating here in the United States. And again, the Biden administration came in quite sensitive to that. They've they've got, uh, I forget what the name of the program is, but but basically the, the, the thrust of it is an intention to spend 40% of all of the, you know, very large amounts of money uh, that are called for by their proposed legislation in communities that have been poorly served uh, environmentally uh, in the United States. And the the equity issues, I know Jim was talking about the equity, issue, equity issues internationally, which are, are very, very important. Uh, and and also important, even if, if, if I go back to the, to the comment I made about helping India uh, get off coal, I mean, any country, South Africa, India, Vietnam, Pakistan, who's going to try to get off coal is going to leave a lot of people out of work, or China, by the way. And, and so taking those issues into account and, and, uh, and having a just transition, which is sort of the buzzword used, um, is... Uh, is a, I mean, the language has been floating around in agreements for a long time. It's gotten to be much more salient now, much more important. So uh, we've gone over time. I hope you all don't mind. I appreciate your hanging in there, but it's a rare treat and an opportunity to have somebody who's been on the front lines of this and can really share with you some of the perspectives on this. So once again, let me uh, ask you to join me in, in thanking uh, Todd Stern for, for joining us. <laughs>